prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great abundance of blessings, spiritual, material, with which you lavish your children. We ask you to send the Holy Spirit with the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, that through our small efforts we may receive a greater knowledge of a special little daughter of yours, Saint Philomena, the little princess saint, and that we may have the grace to open our homes and open our hearts to this most powerful instrument that comes from your heart, desirous to be received by ours. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, Patron of the Church, in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, it is a true joy for me to be able to speak to you about the life and devotion of a saint that in some sense has been kept secret, but through no desires of heaven. She is a saint who has been called by the 19th century popes the Thamaterga, the miracle worker of the 19th century. She has been declared by blessed Pope Pius IX as the patroness of the children of Mary. She is the saint whom the great John Vianney, a mystic, clearly in his own right, said the following, quote, I have never asked for anything through the intercession of my little saint, Philomena, without having been answered, end quote. She is a saint to whom the saints themselves have shown tremendous devotion, including Pope St. Pius X, Blessed Anna Maria Taichi, the mother mystic, St. Peter Julian Emmart, who was cured through the intercession of St. Philomena. Blessed Pauline Jericho, who was the foundress of the propagation for faith. St. Damien of Malachi, the leper priest, who consecrated his first church to St. Philomena. Even St. Peter Chanel, the first saint of Oceana. And lastly, I can say that by way of introduction, devotion to St. Philomena is exploding throughout the Catholic world this day, in this age. So, without further ado, I want to go into four parts about the life and devotion to the princess saint, St. Philomena. Number one, I want to talk about the history from the discovery of the tomb of Philomena to the time she was raised to the altar in 1837. Secondly, I want to speak about the intimate relationship between St. Philomena and the Curé de Ars, St. John Vianney. Thirdly, the appreciation, the, the most remarkable appreciation of the 19th and 20th century popes to this little princess saint. And then lastly, the major forms of devotion that are available and in fact are spreading in a most profound way. Where does this saint come from? Who is this saint who uniquely in the church, uniquely has been canonized solely on the basis of her intercession? Well, on May 24th of 1802, excavators in the ancient tombs of the catacombs of St. Priscilla in Rome, near what they designated as the Greek chapel, found a new grave. And this new grave had three tiles on the front of it. On these tiles were painted the following symbols. First of all, the palm, which is a symbol of martyrdom. Secondly, an anchor. Thirdly, a number of arrows. And in red, the following Latin inscription. On the first tile was the word lumina. The second tile, the combined word pax te, the third tile, the two words, cum fi. And if you begin with the second tile, which was a custom for the catacombs with the words peace you, 
the words in red designated the expression Pax Tecum Philomena, Peace to you, Philomena. Now, with an immediate anatomical examination of the bones, it was estimated that this was a young girl, approximately 13 years of age. In the grave was found a vial of blood, and this was also typical for martyrs of the early church. Or the Christian faithful would include a vial of blood in the tomb with them. Now, immediately, Monsignor Palzetti, the Vatican custodian of relics, began searching the Roman martyrology, saying, what do we know about this Philomena? And the response was essentially nothing. At the same time, you have a humble little priest from a Neapolitan town uh, named Mugnano in southern Italy, named Father Francis di Lucia. And Father Francis was going to Rome because he was in charge of a parish that had, in his words, uh, grown weak in virtue. And he thought the best way he could restore a spiritual life of the parish is to bring back the remains of a known martyr from the catacombs. So, he asked for the help of his bishop, the bishop-elect Monsignor de Cesare, and even the royal ambassador of Naples got involved, and through a process of intercession, Pius VII gave him permission to take this Philomena back to his failing, uh, weakened parish in Mugnano, Italy. This is in 1805. Immediately, immediately, the miracle worker begins her intercession. Within the first months of this unknown saint, of this unknown person in the catacombs being brought to this parish, you have a series of miracles which were officially recorded by the bishops and the priests of the region. Uh, for example, while they still know nothing about this woman, this, this, this young woman, this 13-year-old girl, the local woman who's dressing the sacred remains, who had a uh, disease which was designated incurable by the physicians of the day for 12 years, uh, she is immediately cured by just trying to give dress to the sacred remains. Also, on the same day, an attorney, a lawyer, is carried into the chapel, suffering from sciatica immediately upon entering the sacred remains, the vicinity. He is miraculously cured. Further, a noble lady with a cancerous ulcer, all of this is recorded in the official documentation of the parish, the day before she is scheduled for an amputation because of a cancer and a spreading gangrene in her leg, she is immediately cured. Uh, and perhaps the most remarkable, as soon as the remains of the little saint are brought into the church, which was named Our Lady of Grace, and we will see without any question the juxtaposition of our Blessed Mother and St. Philomena, because it is a powerful combination. But as soon as the body is brought into the church and the bells of this little Italian town ring, the town paralytic, a man named Angelo uh, Bianchi, is immediately cured, but unknown to the town. He runs into the doors of the church, screaming and waving his hands, saying he's cured. And the whole church turns back and looks. He said, I was cured the moment I heard the bell that our saint had arrived. Now, this is some type of entry into a small little parish. And the number of miracles goes on and on. Well, over these next few years, we're still in the 1805 to 1810 period, word of these miracles grows throughout Italy. And of course, as you would expect, people begin to pilgrimage. Also, the Pope at the time, Pope Gregory XVI, hears about these wonders coming from Mugnano, Italy. For example, the great mystic Blessed Anna Maria Tiegi, the housewife mystic, the mother, the mother who would have cardinals waiting in her house to see her because of her prophetic ability, but the mother who would also tell them to wait until her husband and children were fed, 
keeping her first priorities in order. She daily prayed to St. Philomena. On her deathbed, she commended her family, her children, to St. Philomena. And sometime before her death, when her granddaughter, Pepina, had an accident, and in this accident, the granddaughter ripped the pupil of her eye in such a way, as the doctor said, is completely incurable. Blessed Anna Maria took some of the oil which burns at the lamp, uh, the oil lamp at the tomb of Philomena, applied it to the eye of her granddaughter by the next morning. Her sight was perfect. So, Blessed Anna Maria Taigi had this constant devotion, and this also, this idea of the oil, as we'll talk about, came because when this, un, remember, unknown saint to this time, this unknown saint comes into this little church of Our Lady of Grace, a mother with a blind child went to the oil lamp, she dipped her finger into the oil, she applied it to the eyes of her young son, immediately he saw. So the miracles go on and on. A curious phenomena takes place when the bishop Bishop de Cesare, begins to send out the dust from the bones of St. Philomena because she's becoming a item, a spiritual item throughout Italy. So he starts scraping just the dust from the bones of St. Philomena and sends it out. But he finds that as he sends more of the dust out, he has not in any way taken away from the, the first class relic, the dust of the bones, which he has. And this goes on and on. So finally, he reports it to the Vatican Congregation of Rites. And they say, well, let us see if this is in fact a miracle of God or perhaps just a sentimentality or a hopeful wish. So the Congregation of Rites did this. They took the relics of St. Philomena and the dust that's on the relics, and they took the relics of another saint, untold, and they started sending out relics of both to see how much of the dust from the bones would be taken. And as they were sending these relics all over Italy, they found that as the dust from the bones of the, the, the test saint, if you will, the unknown test saint, uh, grew less and less and finally was depleted, Philomena's was untouched. In fact, at the end of the experiment, they found they had more dust. So, confirmed right by the Congregation of Rites, truly this was a soul which God, in only the way he desires, wanted her to be known and to be known quickly. Now, perhaps the best known miracle of this saint, again unknown to this time, was the case of Blessed Pauline Jericho. Now, Blessed Pauline Jericho was a daughter of an aristocratic family. Uh, she was a remarkable young woman. She was a close friend of John Vianney's. And she started what today we call the propagation of the faith. And basically what she did is she went to the textile workers of Lyon and said, can you give me a penny a week for the missions? And of course, who could refuse a penny a week? So as they kept doing this, they began to have hordes of money coming in, sending it out to the mission. And from this young French woman, you had the Vatican adopt what is today called the propagation of faith for the missionary activity of the church. Well, at the tender age of 35, believe me, as you hit 40, you realize how tender that is, she is gravely ill. She has serious heart disease. And she goes to the curie and says, what should I do? The curie says, go to the tomb of Philomena. And so, in fact, she goes, even though the doctor said, you can go, but you will never make it. Well, she is in process to Mugnano, and she stops in Rome. Uh, Mugnano is in Naples, so it's, it's further south. And because of the appreciation of Pauline Jericho by the church, Pope Gregory XVI agreed to meet her on the way. Well, by the time she got there, she was gravely ill. They thought she was going to die. So, out of respect, Gregory the Sixteenth goes to the Sacred Heart Convent, where it looks like Pauline is going to die, and visits her there. 
And, and as soon as he sees her, he says, and Pauline recorded the words, the Pope says to Pauline, quote, pray for the church and its head as soon as you arrive in paradise. Pauline responds, quote, yes, Holy Father, I promise you, but if I walked on foot to the Vatican upon my return from Muniano, would your holiness deign to proceed without delay to the final inquiry into the cause of Philomena? Gregory the Sixteenth responded, of course, because in that case it would be a first-class miracle. But as the Pope leaves the area of Pauline, he says to an Italian sister in Italian, uh, non vedramo mai, we'll never see her again. So Pauline continues, on August 8th, she goes down to Mugnano, and the witnesses say that by the time she gets to Mugnano, quote, she looks more like a corpse than a living person. And you have to understand that word got out that Pauline Jericho was going to go down and ask for the intercession of St. Philomena. So there were people in the streets, and they were cheering her on and whatnot, and even while she was coming in, the people of Mugnano would say, don't worry. Our saint will take care of you. Don't worry. You will be cured. Don't worry. This is our little saint. She will come through. Well, Saturday evening, and Pauline is able to go to the chapel, and nothing happens. Several times on Sunday, she goes to several masses. She prays. She tries to adore, even though she's very weak. Nothing happens. Uh, by Monday morning, the townspeople began in what you might call a particularly southern Italian manner, their mode of intercession. They were saying things like, and it was documented, St. Philomena, your reputation is at stake. <laughs> Do you hear us, Philomena? So this is Monday, and Pauline tries to kneel, but she collapses. And she later mentioned that as she was collapsed in front of the tomb, she began to feel a certain healing power. But it was only the afternoon of August 10th when our Eucharistic Lord was in a benediction, when our Lord was raised high, that Pauline was instantly cured. And of course, the place erupted. And that next day, she walked for the huge crowd, and there were processions throughout the streets of Mugnano, processions through Naples, all the way up to Rome. But the Pope had not yet heard of the miracle. And so Pauline asked permission that she could enter the Vatican chambers of the Holy Father without being announced. So, she was given permission, and once again Pauline records the words, she walks into the chambers of Gregory the 16th. The Holy Father said in astonishment, quote, is it really you or an apparition? Is this really my daughter? And has she come back from the grave or has God manifested in her favor the power of the virgin martyr? End quote. The Holy Father had her walk and then run through the Vatican halls. <laughs> In fact, members of the curie were saying, Holy Father, this is not a holiness. We shouldn't have her run. And he said, Lashastai, leave her alone. Let her run. So she's running through the Vatican halls. When the Pope says, run, you run. You know? <laughs> for a year, for a year, Gregory XVI had her stay in Rome to see her as often as he could to make sure it was a miracle. And then finally, on January 30th, 1837, Gregory the Sixteenth raised St. Philomena to the altars of the Church solely on the power of her intercession, solely in light of her miracles. This is the beauty of the mystical body of Christ. It's a heart faith. Even without all the details of the head, the heart of the Vicar of Christ was satisfied because of these powerful intercessory miracles, one after another. Soon after, a mass and an office was approved in honor of St. Philomena, which was also unknown for an unknown saint. In fact, she was one of the only saints and martyrs of the early church that received a proper mass and office. While this is taking place, contemporaneous to this, 
three people throughout Italy, different areas of Italy unknown to each other, begin to receive the life of St. Philomena through the vehicle of various forms of private revelation. Now, the most well-known of these locutions were the locutions given to Mother Luisa de Jesus in August of 1833. Mother Luisa was immediately approved by the Holy Office of the time. These three individuals all received the same information, differences in degree of how much information, but all the same information about precisely historically who this saint was. So what I'd like to do right now is I would like you to hear from the official documentation of Father de Lucia from this Mother Luisa of uh, Jesus uh, what exactly was said. And the process of how that took place was the following. This Mother Luisa was praying to St. Philomena. She thought she heard a voice tell her the day of death, the actual day that Philomena was killed, which was August 10th, interestingly the same day that Pauline Jericho was healed, and also details, very specific details, of her trip from Rome to Mugnano, details that the public did not know. So, Mother Luisa immediately told her superior, and she began to fast and pray more, uh, thinking that this was an illusion and something dangerous. The superior sent it down to Padre de Lucia and said, you know, is this true? This, this mother's sister has, this religious sister has received this information. Father de Lucia confirmed every minute detail of the revelation and wrote back and said, please ask her to be open for anything more that the saint may want her to say. So under obedience, Mother Luisa, with a certain hesitancy, once again asked the saint, is there anything more you want to be revealed? And immediately, the saint Philomena began to reveal more of her life story. So this is all recorded in the Relazione Historio de Santa Philomena, the official records, but I would like Sister Teresa from the Order of the Sacred and Immaculate Hearts to read you the full account of the life, and because her voice is a little bit more likened to St. Philomena than my own, uh, I've asked her to read the full account of what was revealed to Mother Luisa. My dear sister, I am the daughter of a prince who governed a small state in Greece. My mother was also of royal blood. My parents were without children. They were idolaters. They continually offered sacrifices and prayers to their false gods. A doctor from Rome named Publius lived in the palace in the service of my father. This doctor professed Christianity. Seeing the affliction of my parents by the impulse of the Holy Spirit, he spoke to them of Christianity and promised to pray for them if they consented to receive baptism. The grace which accompanied his words enlightened their understanding and triumphed over their will. They became Christians and obtained the long-desired happiness that Publius had assured them as the reward of their conversion. At the moment of my birth, they gave me the name of Lumina, in allusion to the light of faith, of which I had been, as it were, the fruit. The day of my baptism, they called me Philomena, or Daughter of Light, because on that day I was born to the faith. The affection which my parents bore me was so great that they would have me always with them. It was on this account that they took me to Rome on a journey that my father was obliged to make on the occasion of an unjust war with which he was threatened by the haughty Diocletian. I was then 13 years old. On our arrival in the capital of the world, we proceeded to the palace of the emperor and were admitted for an audience. As soon as Diocletian saw me, his eyes were fixed upon me. He appeared to be prepossessed in this manner during the entire time that my father was stating with animated feelings, everything that could serve for his defense. As soon as Father had ceased to speak, the Emperor desired him to be disturbed no longer, to banish all fear, to think only of living in happiness. These are the Emperor's words. I shall place at your disposal all the force of the Empire. I ask only one thing, that is, the hand of your daughter. My Father, dazzled with an honor he was far from expecting, 
willingly acceded on the spot to the proposal of the emperor. When we returned to our own dwelling, father and mother did all they could to induce me to yield to Diocletian's wishes and to theirs. I cried, Do you wish that for the love of a man I should break the promise I have made to Jesus Christ? My virginity belongs to him. I can no longer dispose of it. But you were young then, too young, answered my father, to form such an engagement. He joined the most terrible threats to the command that he gave me to accept the hand of Diocletian. The grace of my God rendered me invincible. My father, not being able to make the emperor relent in order to disengage himself from the promise he had given, was obliged by Diocletian to bring me to the imperial chamber. I had to withstand for some time beforehand a new attack from my father's anger. My mother, uniting her efforts to his, endeavored to conquer my resolution. Caresses, threats, everything was employed to reduce me to compliance. At last I saw both of my parents fall at my knees and say to me, with tears in their eyes, My child, have pity on your father, your mother, your country, our country, our subjects. No, no, I answered them. My virginity, which I have vowed to God, comes before everything, before you, before my country. My kingdom is heaven. My words plunged them into despair, and they brought me before the emperor, who, on his part, did all in his power to win me. But his promises, his allurements, his threats were equally useless. He then got into a violent fit of anger and, influenced by the devil, had me cast into one of the prisons of the palace, where I was loaded with chains. Thinking that pain and shame would weaken the courage with which my divine spouse inspired me, he came to see me every day. After several days, the emperor issued an order for my chains to be loosed that I might take a small portion of bread and water. He renewed his attacks, some of which, if not for the grace of God, would have been fatal to purity. The defeats which he always experienced were for me the preludes to new tortures. Prayer supported me. I ceased not to recommend myself to Jesus and his most pure mother. My captivity lasted 37 days when, in the midst of a heavenly light, I saw Mary holding her divine son in her arms. My daughter, she said to me, three days more of prison, and after forty days you shall leave this state of pain. Such happy news renewed my courage to prepare for the frightful combat awaiting. The Queen of Heaven reminded me of the name I had received in baptism, saying, You are Lumina, as your spouse is called Light or Sun. Fear not, I will aid you. Now, nature, whose weakness asserts itself, is humbling you. In the moment of struggle, grace will come to you to lend its force. The angel who is mine also, Gabriel, whose name expresses force, will come to your succor. I will me recommend you especially to his care. The vision disappeared, leaving my prison scented with a fragrance like incense. I experienced a joy out of this world, something indefinable. What the Queen of Angels had prepared for me was soon experienced. Diocletian, despairing of bending me, decided on public chastisement to offend my virtue. He condemned me to be stripped and scourged, like the spouse I preferred to him. These were his horrifying words. Since she is not ashamed to prefer to an emperor like me, a malefactor condemned to an infamous death by his own people, she deserves that my justice shall treat her as he was treated. The prison guards hesitated to unclothe me entirely, but they did tie me to a column in the presence of the great men of the court. They lashed me with violence until I was bathed in blood. My whole body felt like one open wound, but I did not faint. The tyrant had me dragged back to the dungeon expecting me to die. I hoped to join my heavenly spouse. Two angels, shining with light, appeared to me in the darkness. They poured a soothing balm on my wounds, bestowing on me a vigor I did not have before the torture. When the emperor was informed of the change that had come over me, he had me brought before him. He viewed me with a greedy desire and tried to persuade me 
that I owed my healing and regained vigor to Jupiter, another god, whom he, the emperor, had sent to me. He attempted to impress me with his belief that Jupiter desired me to be empress of Rome. Joining to these seductive words promises of great honor, cooing the most flattering words, Diocletian tried to caress me. Fiendishly, he attempted to complete the work of hell which he had begun. The divine spirit, to whom I am indebted for constancy in preserving my purity, seemed to fill me with light and knowledge. To all the proofs which I gave of the solidity of our faith, neither Diocletian nor his own courtiers could find an answer. Then the frenzied emperor dashed at me, commanding a guard to chain an anchor around my neck and bury me deep in the waters of the Tiber. The order was executed. I was cast into the water, but God sent to me two angels who unfastened the anchor. It fell into the river mud, where it remains, no doubt, to the present time. The angels transported me gently. In full view of the multitude upon the river bank, I came back unharmed, not even wet, after being plunged with the heavy anchor. When a cry of joy arose from the watchers on the shore, and so many embraced Christianity by proclaiming their belief in my God, Diocletian attributed my preservation to secret magic. Then the emperor had me dragged through the streets of Rome and shot with a shower of arrows. My blood flowed, but I did not faint. Diocletian thought that I was dying and commanded the guards to carry me back to the dungeon. Heaven honored me with a new favor there. I fell into a sweet sleep. A second time, the tyrant attempted to have me pierced with sharper darts. Again, the archers bent their bows. They gathered all their strength, but the arrows refused to second their intentions. The emperor was present. In a rage, he called me a magician, and thinking that the action of the fire could destroy the enchantment, he ordered the darts to be made red in a furnace and directed against my heart. He was obeyed, but these darts, after having gone over a part of the space which they were to cross to come to me, took a quite contrary direction and returned to strike those by whom they had been hurled. Six of the archers were killed by them. Several among them renounced paganism. The people began to render public testimony to the power of God that protected me. These murmurs and acclamations infuriated the tyrant. He determined to hasten my death by piercing my neck with a lance. My soul took flight toward my heavenly spouse, who placed me with the crown of virginity and the palm of martyrdom in a distinguished place among the elect. The day that was so happy for me and saw me enter into glory was Friday, the third hour after midday, the same hour that saw my divine master expire. What is so confirmatory from a historical perspective is not only the other testimonies, one being a priest and the other an Italian gentleman, of similar uh, occasions of what took place, but also a couple facts. Number one, that Diocletian was known for executing Christians by use of arrows, uh, as exemplified by St. Sebastian. Diocletian was also known for killing Christians by tying anchors around their neck and throwing them into water. And furthermore, even the name Lumina, which is on the first tile, uh, which was her first given name of light, would express the creative nature of why that first tile was Lumina and then Paxte and Cum Fi. And I think most of all, why is St. Philomena making such a comeback today? Why is our Lord and our Mother wishing this to take place? Because, number one, she was pure without the support of her family. She was pure against the wishes of her family. And is that not sadly the case in so many cases today? Secondly, she persevered under persecution with, with a remarkable strength in enduring several martyrdoms. And has our Holy Father not, especially in this last year, talked more than ever about Christian martyrdom? about a willingness to offer everything for our Lord, in whatever way we're called to do that. And so, who better than this young, pure saint to give us that kind of strength and that kind of wisdom? But let me jump back to modern times, and I want to speak about the relationship between Philomena 
and the Curie des Arts. Uh, from the first moments that the Curie heard of this saint, there was a union of heart which led to direct supernatural experiences. Uh, St. Philomena appeared to St. John Vianney on numerous occasions. Uh, one documented occasion was when John Vianney was sick with double pneumonia. He was given up for dead. He received the last rites. With his last words, he asked that a mass be offered for St. Philomena on his behalf, at which time St. Philomena appeared to him, cured him, and gave him personal information that gave him strength for the rest of his life. Uh, he was later to confide to a friend, quote, I had a hard time discovering the will of God concerning an enterprise that bothered me. This enterprise was needing funds for a new church, and his assistant priest was encouraging him to take the funds from the separate fund for missionary activity. St. Philomena appeared to me. She had come down from heaven, and she was beautiful, luminous, surrounded by a white cloud. She told me twice, quote, your works are more perfect because there is nothing more precious than the salvation of souls. So a number of direct supernatural communications with the curé. The curé was the first to erect a chapel to St. Philomena in France. And uh, truly, I will not do any justice to the litany of miracles between this mystical body combination of St. Philomena and the curé of ours, who on his own read souls, on his own was, you know, patron saint. On his own, Satan conferred to him at one time, if there were three such men as you alive, I would be powerless on the face of the earth. So imagine what the combination of these two affect. Uh, I want to give you, in fact, the records at ours record as many as 14 miracles per week from people coming to ours both for St. Philomena and for the Curé. Uh, the Curé's constant practice was always directing people who needed any physical cure to St. Philomena, usually in one of two ways. Number one, to do a novena to St. Philomena, or number two, he would send oil of St. Philomena to the people in need. A couple testimonies. One was from a gentleman who had come from a distant town and he said to the curé that he was coming because he had heard there were extraordinary things happening. And the curé responded, quote, what do you mean, extraordinary things in my parish? You must not believe everything you hear. The man said, well then, Father, when I get back to Kusan, I will say nothing is happening in your parish. The curé responded, quote, in that case, you would be lying. You must not do that. Tell them that everything is happening through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and St. Philomena. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, the paralyzed, and the possessed are healed. But it is only through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin and St. Philomena. Uh, another case was St. Peter Julian Emard, the founder of the Society of the Blessed Sacrament. He came in a serious condition. He was also taken for dead. The curé saw him and said, go back, you will be cured, pray to St. Philomena, but you won't be cured here, you'll be cured further away. And as soon as he returned to his home, Father was cured, Father Peter. And it was interesting that the curé would often say to his catechism class, why can't my little saint cure them somewhere else? I can't keep up with all the people that are coming here. Why can't it happen elsewhere? So... It would go on. Another occasion, Francois Ferdinand, a hotel keeper at ours, relates, quote, and these are all documented in the canonization of the curé. This is what happened to me. I came down with a serious illness which caused terrible swelling to the point it had reached my chest. I was taken to Villafranc for medical care. The doctors declared that my blood was contaminated and there was no remedy for it. With that, my parents absolutely wanted to take me home. The curé came to see me. He told me that I only had two days to live, but that if I was willing to have confidence and follow his advice, I would be healed. If you make a novena to St. Philomena with your parents and me, he said, when it is over, you will go to Fourvier in Thanksgiving. This seemed impossible to me, but I followed his advice anyway. On the fourth day, I got up. On the ninth, I harnessed my horse and went to Lyon with my family. 
Mrs. Marie Robert relates the following incident, quote, Father Vianney was teaching his 11 o'clock catechism class. I can still see him in his little stall next to the Blessed Virgin's altar. All of a sudden, the church door opened abruptly, causing us all to turn our heads to look. Three people were there by the holy water font, a woman and a man holding a child in his arms. Looking at these newcomers, Father Vianney said to them with a sigh, Poor people, you came so far to seek something here that you have at home. Your faith is great. Then he went on with his catechism lesson. At the end, after reciting the Angelus, he spoke again to the father and mother in a loud voice, saying, quote, Take your child to St. Philomena, over there to the left. The unfortunates crossed the church and went to kneel before the statue of St. Philomena. Suddenly, we heard a loud noise of moving chairs. The father had passed out. On hearing his son speak for the first time, the six-year-old boy had been paralyzed, deaf, and dumb from birth. Quote, nice, Papa, nice, the child said in his native dialect, and he began to walk. The man explained to us, weeping with joy, we came to ours to ask for the healing of our son who has never talked and never walked. The miracles go on and on and on. This union of heart between this old French prelate and this young Roman martyr is beautifully conveyed in the words of the late Cardinal Manning, who says, Mysterious and wonderful is the sympathy which thrills through the communion of saints, unbroken by distance, undimmed by time, unchilled by death. The youthful saint went forth from her mother's arms to die for Christ, the lictor's axe chopped the budding lily, and pious hands gathered it up and laid it in the tomb. And so fifteen centuries went by, and none on earth thought upon the virgin martyr, who was following the lamb whithersoever he went, till the time came when the Lord would have her glory to appear. And then he chose a champion for her in the lonely, toil-worn priest, to whom he had given a heart as childlike, and a love as heroic as her own. He gave her to be the helpmate of his labors, and bade her stand by him to shelter his humility behind the brightness of her glory, lest he should be affrighted at the knowledge of his own power with God. Now, the 19th and 20th century Holy Fathers it begins with Pope Leo XII, who from the beginning gave permission that altars would be dedicated and chapels erected in her honor. Gregory XVI, as we've talked about, who made her a saint, raised her to the altar of the church, granted her a special feast, August 11th, and also approved a special mass in her honor. Blessed Pius IX had a remarkable devotion to St. Philomena. In fact, the mother of Pius IX prayed to St. Philomena because... Pius IX, as a kid, had a problem with epilepsy, and she was answered, and of course, much more. As bishop, Pius IX made many pilgrimages to the tomb of St. Philomena. Pius declared her, quote, the patroness of the children of Mary, and at a critical time in the history of the church, when the Holy Father had to leave Rome, he had to flee Rome because of a revolution in 1849, where did the Holy Father go? He went to the tomb of St. Philomena. Now, you have to realize... The popes can go anywhere they want. I mean, there's tombs of saints all... There's, there's 300 churches, 5,000 chapels. Where did Pius IX go? He went down two hours south to Mugnano and knelt before the tomb of St. Philomena and begged the grace to return to Rome. He later confided, when kneeling before her bones, that he, quote, received an interior certainty of his soon return to Rome, which took place. It goes on. At the moment of the death of Pius IX, by the way, he had the pectoral cross removed from his chest and placed on the sacred remains of St. Philomena. It's, it's incredible the, the, the love and the attention, the ecclesial support she gets. Leo XIII started the Arch Confraternity of St. Philomena, and truly, with an almost unprecedented generosity, he approved and indulgence the cord of St. Philomena, which we'll talk about in a few moments. The cord is white and red colored. It is in honor of the virginity and the martyrdom of St. Philomena. It was strongly promoted by the curé, 
who some attribute to Curie with the origins of the chord. On into the 20th century, Pope St. Pius X, also a tremendous devotion to St. Philomena, he beatified the cure. He also advocated wearing the cord and declared, quote, all the decisions and declarations of his predecessors regarding St. Philomena should in no way be altered. So, this is the ecclesial support for this young saint, based on the power of her intercession. Now, a bit of a confusing moment in this history was when in 1961, during the kind of historical critical purging of the calendar, without any reference to her canonization, without any reference to the masses, which are all still viable, of course, the Congregation of Rites uh, asked the universal calendar to remove the name of St. Philomena. Now, that was not a, a factor in our country because her name wasn't on the universal calendar as applied in the States anyway. But it was a liturgical directive during a time of a historical cleansing. They dropped a number of, of historical feasts of our Lord and the Blessed Mother, other saints, but the irony of the reasoning was this, why many people were shocked, was because she was brought to the altar, she was raised to the altar, granting no historical knowledge of her. She was raised to the altar on the very fact of the power of her intercession. What was behind some of the thinking with this liturgical act, which again, has nothing to do with her canonization? Well, there was one professor, Professor Marucci in 1903, who came up with some rather dubious archaeological conclusions. And in essence, his conclusions were this, that because the three tiles on her grave were in a different order, in other words, it's the middle tile where the pox tecum begins, he came to the conclusion that these tiles had been taken off, Philomena's bones had been removed, and some other martyr bones were put in here. Immediately, this was counted at the time by the leading Jesuit archaeologist, Bonavenia, but also a, a number of archaeologists and historians since that time have said there's absolutely no ground for this for a couple reasons. Number one, because you, oftentimes it was a custom that if you had three tiles, you started with the pax tecum, the peace be with you, in the middle, because that was the heart of the message, was peace. Secondly, that you would never take these three off and replace them because they were brick tiles. And there wouldn't be value in using, reusing brick tiles. If they had marble tiles, you could replace them. Number three, every archaeologist that's examined the tiles has seen they could not have been removed because when you remove the tile, the, 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 the cementing on the outside is, of course, broken and chipped. And these are not, and Marucci never examined the tomb. It was an abstraction that was never there. Number four, which we now know, Lumina was the first name of this saint. So that she would start with Lumina and then Phi Lumion or Philia Lumini, the, the, the daughter of light, would be appropriate. So there have been a horde of corrections of this. A modern Austrian historian, Markov, says that the foundings are, quote, superficial and lacking historical objective. How are we supposed to take the directive? Paul, Pope Paul VI gives us the answer, because Pope Paul VI was asked by Bishop Fernandez, who was the bishop from India, from Mysore, India, where there was a cathedral of St. Philomena, how are we supposed to take this directive? And the recorded words of Paul VI are as follows, quote, continue as before and do not upset the people. So, obviously, this saint who has been appearing to John Vianney, the saint who has been just overwhelmed with indulgences by the church, the saint who the saints prayed to, and on and on, is viable, and not just viable for the 19th century, she's viable for now. And so I think we have to follow that papal wisdom and see how the church continues to bless these devotions. Now, lastly, what are the major forms of devotion to St. Philomena? Number one, the core, as I mentioned. The cord consists in tying a cord around the body. The cord is of wool, linen, or cotton. It is colored red and white in honor of virginity and martyrdom. At the end of one end of the cord are two knots, which also symbolize uh, virginity and martyrdom. Uh, there is no ceremony necessary for conferring or wearing the cord. 
The cords can be obtained, as I'll talk about in a moment, from St. Philomena's centers, or they can be made on their own, and there's a blessing in the Roman ritual for the cord. There is a prayer that is recommended to be prayed daily for those who wear the cord, and I want to read the prayer. It's very uh, brief, but it really summarizes the charism of this young saint. O Saint Philomena, virgin and martyr, pray for us that through your powerful intercession we may obtain that purity of mind and heart which leads to the perfect love of God. So, the cord, tremendous intercessory power. Second form of devotion, the oil. As mentioned, there's a oil lamp that burns at the tomb of St. Philomena. It's important we get it from that tomb. The oil has been sent throughout the world. Again, tremendous intercessory miracles. I can testify we did a, a national radio show on St. Philomena a few weeks back. Uh, people from all over the country were calling in today, today, calling in and saying the miracles that have happened to the use of the oil. Recently I heard that one mother uh, had a child with night terror. You familiar with night terrors when kids will wake up screaming? Not sure what they are. She started blessing her kid with the oil of St. Philomena. They stopped entirely. One night, she forgot to bless the child. The night terrors returned. She started the next night blessing her. It was over. That's kind of causal. So, tremendous intercessory power through the oil. Third form of devotion is the chaplet. Again, it's very simple. It's an easy way of daily offering uh, devotion to St. Philomena. The chaplet does come from St. John Vianney. The chaplet it consists in praying the creed, three Our Fathers in praise and glory to the three persons of the Trinity, and then followed by 13 Hail Marys. So, creed, three Our Fathers for the Trinity, 13 Hail Marys, in honor of the 13 years of St. Philomena. It ends with the invocation, St. Philomena, pray for us. The fourth mode of devotion is the novena, and you remember with the occasions of the cure, the nine days of prayer to St. Philomena, a uh, tremendous source of intercession. I want to read to you just one novena prayer, which can be prayed. There, there are several, but here is one of them. Quote, O faithful virgin and glorious martyr, St. Philomena, who works so many miracles on behalf of the poor and sorrowing, have pity on me. Thou knowest the multitude and diversity of my needs. Behold me at thy feet, full of misery, but full of hope. I entreat thy charity, O great saint, Graciously hear me, and obtain from God a favorable answer to the request which I now humbly lay before thee. And then you specify your petition. I am firmly convinced that through thy merits, through the scorn, the suffering, and the death thou didst endure, united to the merits of the passion and death of Jesus, thy spouse, I shall obtain what I ask thee, and in the joy of my heart I will bless God, who is admirable in his saints. The typical modes of intercession of St. Philomena are, number one, purity. Any difficulties, you know, there's a constant struggle with purity. Number two, family needs. Number three, financial difficulties. And then number four, uh, physical ailments and ailments of the heart of all sorts. Now, all of these items can be found by designated St. Philomena centers. I just want to give you the address of the International Shrine, the Sanctuary of St. Philomena in Italy, under the address... 83027 Mugnano, that's M U G N A N O, Del D E L Cardinale, Cardinal with an E at the end. The city Avellino, A V E L L I N O, Italy. That's the shrine. All these items can be obtained from the shrine. They also have a website using modern means, as St. Maximilian tells us we must. Uh, www.philomena.it. A book, a quick, a shorter book on St. Philomena, excellent book, St. Philomena, Powerful with God, which is published by Tan. A very good summation of all that we've said. So, in conclusion, I want to add a final encouragement. It's the least objective, it's the least impressive. I'm going to add it anyway. It's been my own experience. And I can really echo the words of St. Augustine that late have I loved thee uh, in reference to Philomena. She's come late into my life. She's come in with tremendous power. I can say for our family, uh, we have received a renewed grace and peace in our marriage, in our family life. Through the intercession, we have an almost tangible presence of this saint. 
she wants to be known. She wants to enter family lives. She wants to enter hearts right now. So I would encourage you, open your hearts to her. Open your homes to her. Reveal your innermost needs. She's here to help, and she's, she's a documented powerhouse of grace. So uh, let's end in prayer and invoking St. Philomena in a special way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sweet Mother of God, Mary Most Holy, Queen of Angels and Saints, our own Mediatrix of all graces, we ask for a new openness of heart to this powerful saint, this daughter of the church, St. Philomena. Help us, in fact, to open our hearts, open our homes, to reveal the innermost needs of our hearts to her with faith and in confidence, with the power of the church, the popes, and the saints. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Philomena, powerful with God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.